Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Yellow Peril in American Film and Visual Culture, a professional development webinar sponsored by America in Class from the National Humanities Center. <clears throat> My name is Richard Schramm. I'm the Vice President for Education Programs here at the Center, and I'll be moderating this evening's session. Before we get underway, let me just introduce the National Humanities Center and America in Class. The center is located in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina. It is the country's only independent institute for advanced study in all branches of the humanities. What that simply means is that we run a fellowship program that brings scholars to the center from this country and abroad to research and write on topics and subjects like history, literature and language studies, philosophy, criticism of the arts, that sort of thing. We are distinct among institutes for advanced study in that we run a vigorous outreach program for teachers. And we do that under the uh, brand America in Class. You folks have discovered the webinars that we offer for American history and literature teachers. And if you go to americaninclass.org, you will be able to gain access to all of the other resources that we offer uh, to assist people in teaching about American culture. Um, at the end of our seminar this evening, if you go to the uh, Images of Asians in American Culture website, you will find a recording of the seminar. You will also find the PowerPoint. Uh, please feel free to, uh, to use the PowerPoint in your classes. Uh, in addition, uh, we archive our webinars on YouTube. So if you ever want to uh, relive this experience, you can go to YouTube and do that. In addition, uh, on this website, you will find an evaluation form. If you'll fill that out, you can do it online and send it back to us. Uh, we really appreciate that. It's important. We listen to what you say, and we try to improve our programs based on what you tell us. Uh, once, you re once you send that back to us, you'll be able to download documentation of participation, which you'll be able to present to your local certifying authority to get whatever recertification credit your participation in this webinar warrants. Now, this evening, we're going to be talking about uh, uh, race, uh, uh, labor unrest, <clears throat> labor difficulties between uh, Asian immigrants and uh, people in San Francisco in the late 19th century. And if you want to bring that material into your classes, I urge you to check out the Chinese question from a Chinese standpoint, 1873. That is a lesson that we offer in America in class. If you go to that lesson, you'll find fine grade fine-grained, text-dependent, close-reading questions, responses for the teachers, printable worksheet to use with your students, and the close-reading questions not only explore content, but they also look at the craft of writing. It's a really good lesson, and it's a great way to bring the material, some of the material from this seminar back into your classes. Now, if you uh, want to find the sources of the images you'll be seeing tonight, you will be seeing a lot of images. You can go to the uh, seminar form, and there uh, if you, you'll find uh, a block that indicates uh, the source for all the images in the webinar tonight, so we can document those. I've already mentioned our documentation of participation. Let me tell you how to participate. Throughout the evening, our leader, Sylvia Chong, will be lecturing, but she'll be stopping to uh, ask discussion questions from time to time, ask for your interpretations, and the way you can respond to that is by putting your cursor in the uh, green box that I've bracketed there, that's at the lower right-hand side of your screen, type your response, hit that send button to the right, and your message will appear in the large chat box above. I'll be following the chat all evening and bringing your questions and comments into the discussion at appropriate moments. Now, please don't wait for us to uh, pose a question. If you have a question or you have a comment, please enter that into the chat. Bring it into the conversation. Don't be afraid to ask your own questions or comments. Give us feedback on how you would teach the material. If you see something that's usable in class, a cartoon, a video clip, uh, something that could be a potential project, share that with us. Remember, the more you participate, the better the webinar will be. So let's get underway, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, before we do, though, let me just let me give you a little bit of warning. We're going to be seeing some. We're going to be seeing some videos, and. Um, the videos often will come up, and, and the movement will start, and this, there'll be a delay uh, before the sound kicks in. Be patient. It'll take a few seconds. Sometimes the sound will kick in, and it will be in sync with the images. So if you don't hear something when the images start moving, don't panic. It's perfectly all right. 
And I know Sylvia Chong is not going to panic. She is our seminar leader this evening. She is an associate professor in the Department of English and the American Studies program at the University of Virginia. She has written widely on Asian American culture, and in 2012, she published the Oriental Obscene Violence and Racial Fantasies in the Vietnam Era. So let me turn Sylvia's microphone. Sylvia, please, it is all yours. Thank you so much, Richard, and welcome to everyone. I'm glad to be here, I'm welcoming you from the sunny Charlottesville, Virginia, but I'm also from California, where I understand some of you are. So, hello. Uh, so Richard, is it my turn to uh, forward through things? Yes, uh, you have control of the board. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to walk you through what is a pretty wide sweeping historical context for a number of key images uh, in Asian, uh, the reception of Asian Americans under the idea of yellow peril in American culture. And so a few notes. Uh, I've given you some readings that you can use as sort of summaries of Asian American history that will go more in depth than what I will be able to today. One of the important key notes I want to make is that sometimes when we talk about race and images, we are stuck talking about critiquing them as mere stereotypes, meaning we want to talk about why they're incorrect. And in some ways that uh, leaves out the more telling parts of the images that are, I don't want to say correct, but um, reflect some reality of the time. And I don't mean that the Asians were really this way, but that this reflects a real conflict going on. So throughout, um, I, I teach film and media and popular culture at UVA. We usually look at these objects uh, without talking about true or false, and which is what I'm going to try to do tonight, and which is something I encourage you to do with your students, but to see what we can tell about attitudes that these images reveal. And uh, these are some bullet points, uh, some Although I'll go through a lot of about 150 years of history, uh, some major points that I will hit will be the conflict over early Chinese labor, the lead up to World War II, um, the immediate Cold War era, and then a tiny bit about our present time. And I think well, let's just start with the, our first very uh, stark image. Uh, there are two political cartoons from the early um, the 1880s that I'm going to begin with, and this moment is really key because Asian immigrants really start arriving in the U.S. in the 1850s, mainly to the West Coast uh, after the California Gold Rush. And by the 1880s, and about 40 years later, uh, although the number of immigrants is small, their presence is symbolically large, and they enter into debates at first about um, slavery and slave labor, and then after Civil War, they enter into debates about what is free labor um, um, or uh, Republican labor. And so one of the clashes that uh, pops up is between members of the working class, uh, specifically the Irish and the Chinese. And so this cartoon represents um, an image from California. In 1882 is an important year because that's the year that the Chinese Exclusion Act is passed. And so I thought we could maybe just start talking about this image a little bit because it's, um, it's one of my favorites to teach. It's very uh, eye-popping and there's a lot of things we can talk about. Uh, and uh, uh, obviously, as a political cartoon, I don't think it can at all represent something like a realistic image of Chinese Americans, but I think it illustrates really well uh, the sorts of fears that people had of the Chinese, um, whether or not they actually knew of one or uh, fought with one over a job. Uh, is that a good Richard? Sure. Uh, why don't we ask our participants to uh, do some interpretation? What do we see here? Um, <clears throat> any comments? And also comment on whether or not you'd use this with your students. I think it, I think it would be pretty, pretty good to use in a class. But uh, what do we see in this image? We got some people um, typing in. Uh, one person doing the work <clears throat> of many. Yeah, kind of an octopus image there, reaching out, taking things over. Um, what else do we see? What about those people on the right? Got some more folks typing in. Sylvia, I know when you and I went over this, I I didn't quite know what to make of those buildings in the background. Um, why don't we wait and see what people say about those figures on the right, and then uh, you can tell us what, what that building right. is back there. I mean, those of you who teach 19th century probably know a lot about this. After um, the Civil War, there is a lot of um, 
industrialization and labor strife. There's a lot of labor strikes, um, violent labor strikes throughout the country, including in the railroad industry. There's a depression going on um, in the 1870s around the Great Panic. Um, and so th there are economic hard times and there is you know, concern about how does uh, a normal labor make his living. Um, and then, so as the comment was saying, one, one person doing the work of many um, was the fear that the Chinese would begin to monopolize labor in these uh, burgeoning industries. So you can kind of see there's shoemaking, um, garment work, uh, cigar, cigarette folding, um, the plank on the, a man's foot says Chinese trade monopoly. Just, you know, stating the obvious right now, but uh, just providing us a little bit of Right. There's a, there, we have some comments. I, uh, Participant writes, Euros not being able to find work. Another participant writes, I think this cartoon would create a great starting point for discussion to explore stereotypes in an historical framework. Definitely provocative, writes another participant. Almost the same attitude is reflected here that we see <clears throat> with the debate over Latinos. Another participant just used this um, this past week, and my ESL students' uh, take on it was that it was immigrant laborers to do the, doing the jobs no one else wants. Uh, another participant writes, that they are doing what no one wants to do, and therefore it seems that they are taking over labor. Were these jobs nobody else wanted to do in 1882, Sylvia? Uh, not necessarily, although they weren't desired jobs. They were definitely not um, step, stepping stones in the middle class. But um, they were new jobs, and obviously uh, the, the factory owners were fighting to pay as little as possible for these jobs. Uh, so whites were not willing to work at what they call you know, coolie wages or Chinese wages. Mm -hmm. So some of it was not just that it was backbreaking work, but it was backbreaking cheap labor. That was another name for Chinese, it was cheap labor. Mm -hmm. um, so you see on the uh, right hand side, um, a set of uh, young white men, um, almost boys, you know, looking uh, completely idle. So the implication is that they can't work um, for a fair wage, because this monstrous octopus over here is working for subhuman wages. Um, and ironically, as, as uh, you know, we can see this debate playing out with um, immigrants today, the work isn't subhuman, but the fact that someone who is sort of racially denigrated is doing it makes it seem like the work is more subhuman. So any dignity in that labor is degraded by the ugliness of the man doing it. Uh, let's ask our participants what they think those buildings are in the background. And in the meantime, Amelia Philbrook writes, reminds me of the fear that all products are made in China today. Well, that, that, that takes an interesting uh, twist on it. But what do you think those buildings are in the background? Because we get that right, it, it, it really uh, enriches the interpretation of this, photograph, of this uh, cartoon. See anybody? Yeah, there's a stock figure, right, that's carrying one of the boys away, sort of a stock yeah, yeah. figure. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any? I might give you a hint. <laughs> yeah, I gave you a hint. Let's see. Is that a Pinkerton escorting a non-native into a factory in the far right of the picture? Aha! See, somebody made the same, thought the same thing that I thought. All right, let, let's see if anybody else is going to take a crack at it, and then Sylvia, if you'll reveal to us what those buildings are supposed to be in the background, I think we'll get uh, an even... Uh, Deeper appreciation of this cartoon. Let's see, we got one more person. Looks like a flag on a building, some kind of industry. Okay, the general consensus seems to be that that's a factory back there, industrialization. Sylvia, what's going on here? West Coasters, you'll like this. It says San Quentin Industrial School. And so it's sort of also a, a hypothesis about juvenile delinquency. Any juvenile delinquency we're going to see, right, prison, that sort of prison slash work, right? Any juvenile delinquency that we'll see among um, young working class whites is not um, their fault, but the fa fault of the Chinese laborer because he makes it impossible for them to work, real work. And I think that San Quentin, you might, you can't see it on this, but I think it's probably written just under that um, smokestack to the, 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 where the black smoke is coming out on, to the right back there. Right. Does that say San Quentin? I believe it does. The top row says San Quentin and the bottom row says industrial school. Yeah, this, this yeah. This is available off um, several library websites, including, I believe, the Library of Congress um, uh -huh. in, in higher resolution. Uh, and so like the approach that I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, these attitudes, obviously some of them are, seem wrongheaded to us today, but they were widely held attitudes. And political cartoons like this were um, 
widely disseminated as part of the debate over what do you do about um, labor questions. And in fact, I think I will um, forward to the next cartoon, which is a similar theme, um, slightly different um, take on it. Uh, this is from a few years earlier, but still a very similar um, issue. So the Chinese must go is a slogan that Dennis Kearney, who is the founder of the Working Man's Party of California, coined. And uh, uh, California exclusionists were some of the most uh, vocal advocates of Chinese exclusion, which was a national law that passed. So I'm just going to read the captions because it may be hard for people to see. Uh, we'll, we'll zoom in on a few images in the next page. But on the top, it says the Chinese must go. You see that racial strife between um, ch Chinese workers. And then in the middle, the Chinese go. And on, on the um, right, New York, the Chinese must come. Help wanted. And then uh, going back to the left again, Mott Street is uh, still the center of um, old Chinatown in New York City. Now it's Mott Street with the flag saying uh, from China. It's kind of overrun, like slum-like with the Chinese. Uh, the middle picture, uh, departing Biddy to the Chinese usurper. Uh, sure as Dennis Kinney will see me right at ye heathen Chinese. Um, you might notice also that in the drawing style, uh, Irish are also... Um, denigrated at this uh, time, that many of them are drawn with sort of simian ape-like figures. That's a common political cartoon representation of the Irish. And the Chinese also is drawn with sort of a dark face and distorted figures. Lady Liberty is throwing life preservers to Chinese who, if you notice, are coming off of a boat from California. And when they first emerge, they look like rats in the water. But it's when they come out that you see it's their cues or ponytails coming out of the water. And then on the bottom, this is the artist imaginary. This is what happens when the Chinese take over. You have a, a primary meeting of the future, but the Chinese are now screaming, the Irish must go. And now an Irish worker is being beaten over the head with the policeman. Uh, a Chinese railroad conductor says, get out, you Irish heathen, although it's, it's spelled with an accent, you Irish heathen. And then a Chinese wave uh, is hosing down um, a way white Americans, including upper class ones, the Chinese make a clean sweep. So uh, it's an interesting cartoon because it's, I think it's so vastly racist against both Chinese and Irish. Um, but it also depicts what must seem like a dystopian future if we were to welcome the Chinese. So it's criticizing the people who, who are making use of the Chinese you know, help wanted in New York. But it's also criticizing you know, what might happen, you know, the dangers of letting the Chinese into America, letting them into society, and if they were to get more traction in society and, and the public. Sylvia, what was, the, <clears throat> what was the, the purpose of this cartoon? Who, who was it aimed at? Was this aimed primarily at the Irish to, to encourage Irish uh, resistance to uh, the Chinese movements into New York? Uh, who was the primary audience for this? Well, the Puck was a satirical magazine that had a lot of, um, it was not one of the largest magazines that had a wide readership and it wasn't working class readership necessarily. Uh, because this cartoon is making fun of the Irish, I don't think it's aimed at the Irish and that, and yet I think it's sympathetic to Dennis Kearney's Working, working Men's Party platform of excluding mm -hmm. the Chinese. Mm -hmm. So it, it cites the Chinese must go, seems to criticize the Irish for their you know, prejudices. Let me forward to the next page. I think we have it close-up of these pictures, uh, seems to, you know, um, criticize the Irish for being racist um, in dri driving out the Chinese, but doesn't necessarily welcome the Chinese. So it's ambivalent. You see this in a lot of political cartoons, um, a wide range of, of positions, some very conscious of the hypocrisy of exclusion politics. And yet, even if you're not pro-exclusion, it doesn't mean you're pro-integration mm -hmm. or pro-assimilation. Now, I notice in the New York cartoon, <clears throat> the people who are welcoming <clears throat> the Chinese workers are all women. Presumably, the Chinese are coming to New York to do domestic work. And that would directly displace Irish workers, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. In fact, the accusation was that the Chinese men, mostly men, were displacing Irish women, domestic, mm -hmm. female domestics. Mm -hmm. And okay. you notice how, how the upper class um, women are drawn differently than the lower class men who are fighting in the San Francisco picture. Yeah, yeah. 
and the one there in the, in the uh, striped dress, I mean, obviously the eye focuses on her. Uh, she's the most dramatic uh, of them. Now, well, shall we move ahead? Yes, okay, I'm gonna zoom through a few of the next photos, the um, images, they are context leading us up to uh, the mid 20th century. So the term yellow peril, as, as I shared in one of the readings, is not an American term only. It was actually used also by the European nations. Uh, and, and the most famous rendering of it was um, Kaiser Wilhelm, or Emperor William of, of Germany. And he had a painting commissioned after a prophetic dream that he had. And he titled it the Gelbes Gefahr, or the, or the yellow peril. And in it, he shows the archangel Michael leading European nations represented by their mythological, you know, Lady Liberty type figures, marching under a, a Christian cross against a, a stormy, dark Buddha figure on the horizon. And the immediate context here, um, again, I think you have to always teach these images into context. And so in the late 1890s, uh, many European nations are uh, seeing Asian immigration, Britain and the US especially. Uh, but they're also, they also have colonial designs on, on, on Asia. Uh, particularly China. Japan has modernized since the Meiji Revolution. And this is, um, I'm touching main historical things very quickly, but um, hopefully they'll be familiar to people. And so Japan has been fighting a war of China. It just recently defeated China and won territorial concessions. And this has greatly incensed the European powers, in particular Germany, France, and Russia, uh, who themselves wanted territory in, in, in China. So uh, the yellow peril is Japan. This is, a, this is an important image. We'll see it pop up again. But it's also you know, potentially any Asian nation that threatens military dominance or competition with Western armies and Western powers. Um, I think those of you who are uh, more familiar with Buddhism, I'm not saying Buddhist countries don't declare war, but it's funny to see Buddha as the uh, harbinger of war uh, in, in that image. So you see main tenets of Orientalism, Christianity versus heathen religions such as Buddhism, um, civilized nations versus uncivilized savage nations, um, and the notion of these colonial conflicts as global race war. And we're going to see that in a second in the, in the first film example. Now, even though yellow peril implies something very negative, there are a lot of somewhat positive images or exoticizingly positive images. There was a craze for all things Japanese because when Japan did take power and resume trade with Western nations, Japanese goods were very chic. Um, and so it was around this time that Gilbert and Sullivan wrote uh, the Mikado, a music theater, theater treatment of ostensibly Japan, but it's a fake Japan. So uh, it's called the town of Tidipu and these three characters who are the three little maids. One of them is one of the main um, uh, romantic uh, Leads. The three little maids are named Yum Yum, Peep Bo, and Pity Sing. So they, they're meant to be Japanese, but they're also satir, uh, supposed to be uh, satires of British society. And so to make it not entirely Japan, they, they, they're played in yellow face by white actors and they're given. jazz versions throughout the 20th century. It shows you that um, fear and uh, admiration slash um, fetishization can sort of um, uh, take place alongside one another. Um, so the Mikado is a great image to show against um, something like this because they, they're almost coterminous. Um, I, I study mostly film, so now as we get into the modern era, I'm gonna have a lot of film examples. And here is one of the first Asian American slash Asian film stars, uh, the actor Sesue uh, Hayakawa. And this is one of his more famous films called The Cheat. I put Burmese into quotations because Japan was still powerful enough at this time that they could object to their representation in American films and things could be changed. So Hayakawa plays a ivory merchant that threatens extortion and attempts rape on a white woman who is borrowing money from her, from him. Uh, he, uh, the only thing they changed to make him Burmese are these, uh, the titles. It's a silent era film. He, he remains throughout the film um, very Japanese in appearance with uh, Japanese themed robes. 
much like the Mikado stuff, and shoji screens in the background. So you see, even with um, popular films, and Hayakawa was an early matinee star who was very popular. Um, he was popular in roles that weren't all villainous, but this one was fairly popular as well. Uh, fulfilled a sort of a dangerous, um, sexually malevolent um, fantasy, you could say, that you might still see later on in um, in representations of Asian men that they are. If they're not necessarily meant to be attractive, but they are sexual menaces to um, American society, and their exoticism is sort of attractive. Uh, so, they're moving ahead a little bit, there's this dichotomy then between pleasant, uh, positive images, you might even say, and negative images. Uh, and they're both part of the yellow peril, I think, because they, they, they always appear together. Uh, even the positive images that are not dangerous. I think a lot of you are familiar with Charlie Chan, one of the most famous American serial depictions of Asian Americans. Uh, this is supposedly the best of the Charlie Chan films. I think there were 40 plus films of Charlie Chan. And all, all of them, except for the first three, had uh, uh, white actors playing Charlie Chan. Uh, I'd be curious if uh, people um, still know about this. It might be an older generation thing, the younger generation. Uh, my students, for example, know little, very little about them. Um, so Werner Oland is what, the most famous Charlie Chan. He was a Swedish American actor who ironically uh, liked to brag that he must have been part Mongolian and that's why he could play Charlie Chan realistically. Um, none of that's true, but uh, that was part of his persona. And he would spout aphorisms, a little fortune cookie-like uh, sayings. In, in this one, I think in the, the, op the opera one has a famous one where he says to his son at the end, number one son, Ki Luke, uh, played by Chinese American Ki Luke, uh, like last rose of summer, you bloom too late. Um, this is admonishment to his son for being too late with the clue. Um, Charlie Chan and Fu Manchu, who I'll show in a second, they're early representations of Asian Americans, um, and they represent this dichotomy of safe, harmless positive versus malevolent, scheming, dangerous. Um, it's hard to totally get away from Charlie Chan because for, for many Chinese Americans, uh, we know from historical research, they welcomed even a, you know, a buck-toothed accented representation because at least he was a hero. He was a detective solving murder mysteries. Um, he was funny and well-loved. There's anecdotes that uh, Werner Oland went to Shanghai in the 30s and he was uh, well received, um, whereas the Chinese American actress Anna Mae Wong went at the same time and she was demonized for playing um, more evil roles. Uh, even though I don't have um, a clip to show you all, I'd be curious if, if anyone has any um, memories or uh, feelings about Charlie Chan, if you've ever used this in, um, um, in any kind of context. Well, let's see. <clears throat> they ask our participants. <clears throat> Any of you uh, old enough to remember Charlie Chan? I certainly remember Charlie Chan movies. I enjoyed them as a, as a kid. We have some people typing in. He, um, so he always struck me as, as he solved the crimes through ratiocination. He always seemed to be uh, almost mystical in his abilities to, uh, to to figure out clues and make connections. Is that any kind of a characteristic uh, that uh, American culture ascribed to uh, to Asians? Um, not necessarily, and I think that's one of the ways he was sort of positive, right? He um, he wasn't um, necessarily stupid, you know, mm -hmm. like like laborers were presented. Um, mm -hmm. At the same time, because he spoke in fortune cookie type language mm -hmm. and it was very mysterious about the way he actually would find the solution. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there would be an implication that it was some kind of oriental wisdom that led to it. Yeah. yeah, that's a good way to put it, or oriental wisdom. Now here we have some participants. I have never used these clips in class, but I remember my grandparents, oh Lord, being familiar with Charlie Chan. They viewed him in a positive light. And Jay, yes, we're showing our age. Uh, I remember Charlie Chan movies. Good for you, Carmen. I'm glad to hear that. And we they have, were showing them rerun for a long time, and I think they keep trying to want to remake them. The reason why I think it's important to bring him up and have people still see him is that for a generation of Asian Americans in the 70s and later, he was a polarizing figure, and people hated him. It's sort mm -hmm. of uh, saying Charlie Chan would be like saying like Uncle Tom. You know, it was some sort of hated stereotype. 
And uh, I think now, um, you know, a little bit with a little bit of distance from the civil rights era, we can look at these icons a little bit more complexly. I'm not. I'm not trying to say I love him um, or see myself um, or my Asian American uh, family in him, but he, uh, like like you were saying, Richard, he he was uh, he was smart. He was canny, and mm -hmm. a lot of people really liked the uh, the style with which he he solved mysteries. Right, and Amelia writes, "I do not remember Charlie Chan, though I've heard that phrase uh, that you mentioned about coming too late. It amazes me that this representation was preferred." to being ignored. Um, yeah, what does that tell us about the position of Asians in the 30s, that they would prefer this image as opposed to being ignored? I think it speaks to people's desperation to be represented in some uh -huh. way. Mm -hmm. And when you see the next one, which I'm going to show a clip from, uh, compared to the other stuff that was around, like the octopus laborer um, or the, cool, the rat coolie, um, Charlie Chan was um, seemingly refreshing. And mm -hmm. these early Chinese Americans, so uh, the early Chinese Americans, they had to have arrived um, before 1882. And after 1882, there was no more legally new immigration, although people had ways of sneaking in um, uh, to avoid this racist law. Uh, so it meant that people felt under siege uh, and their numbers were frozen permanently, I think around 100,000, even as the American population was growing over several million. Uh, so, yeah, there's, there's all these reminiscences from older Chinese Americans who love the movies. Oh, oh Richard, you mentioned that uh, you remembering um, number one son, Key Luke. Mm -hmm. uh, th there was a Chinese American figure who, who played Warner Olin's son. I don't have a picture of him here. But he was also very funny because he was like the assimilated, you know, aw shucks pop kind of figure. Uh, and I think he gave people a, a glimpse of what it might be to be Asian American in a less exotic way. Um, but that's, Boris Kala here, yeah. I'm sorry, Richard, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, that's right, that the number one son was his foil. So let me just see if I can sum up here for a moment. What we're saying is context is all here, that um, the Charlie Chan figure, being a positive figure, uh, was welcome even though he was a caricature. Now, um, I want to show a clip from Fu Manchu. Uh, I, I seem to have frozen it at the middle of the clip. Is there any way to rewind it so that it begins at the beginning? Uh, good question. Let me see if I can do that. Uh, OK, I've just gone back. And let me move to the next slide. No, that's taking us back the to middle. the previous slide. Let's go ahead and play it and see where it starts. It may go back automatically to the beginning. Shall we do that? Yeah. and, and uh, why don't you just sort of pay attention as this movie goes to how different Fu Manchu is constructed as a representation of the Chinese. OK, here we go. Well, we hoped it would go. So you may, you may need to start it up. There we go. OK, I unfortunately, think. this is mid-clip. But this is a clip from the end of the film. The sound will come in in a second. The sacrifice to our God. Would you all have maidens like this for your wives? Then conquer and breathe.
Okay. What shall we make of that? Now, I'll, I'll tell you a little more context. Of it. Um, again, these are ancient movies, but I think um, they're all widely available on DVD, uh, uh, and some of them are, can be found on YouTube. And they represent such touchstones for other people's imaginings. That I think it's really important to look at them. Um, and uh, uh, so I'll just point out some, some narrative stuff. Fu Manchu is supposed to be uh, an evil kind of villain kind of a prototype of later James Bond, Dr. No types. They want to take over the world. Uh, he is Chinese and he kind of uh, lingers in the depths of criminal underground Chinatown, but he's also well-educated. They, they make a big deal about he, how he went to Harvard and Oxford. So there's sort of this implication that he is, uh, he's taken Western knowledge, but he's used it for evil purposes. Uh, you'll notice throughout this scene, um, it's it's even more stark in the beginning of the movie that there's all the oriental stuff. So he is stealing the mask of Genghis Khan. Uh, that's the mask that he's wearing and that's the sword of Genghis Khan. So another yellow peril from history because he thinks by stealing it, he can lead the Asian nations into race war. And so he says there, would you, let's see, where did I write this down? Um, would you all have maidens like this for your wives, then conquer and breed, kill the white man and take his women? And you see in the um, picture, the, I think so, someone just commented on this, this soft focus glamorizing um, the, the female character, Sheila, who's, who's on the stretcher there. Uh, so there's all this very orientalist exotic imagery. The exoticism is uh, multiplied by all the people in the crowd who represent not just one, but multiple, I wanna say not just Asian, but third world nations. This is anachronistic, they're not saying the word third world, but there's sort of Ottoman Empire, there's sort of African, you know, images, Indian, uh, uh, South Asian, Southeast Asian, um, East Asian. And then you see with the torture chamber, that's that giant chair with the spikes, a very art deco modern appearance. So Fu Manchu is both exoticizing and ultra modern. And just after this clip, they use his ultra modern weapon to kill him, so they turn his weapon on himself. It's a static electricity weapon. So these are all really state-of-the-art uh, special effects at the time, and they were also meant to sort of highlight how cruel he was, that he could use these things that would elsewhere be used for technological good, and he's turning them into weapons of mass destruction. Um, so I, I, I uh, gave out a reading about some of the history and con uh, contrast between Charlie Chan and Fu Manchu. So now that you know you've seen the two together, um, I'm curious if now if you you might feel differently about Charlie Chan, but also see some of the Fu Manchu artificially constructs Charlie Chan as positive. Hey, any comments on that? The Fu Manchu movies would enter into the context of the reception of Charlie Chan. They were both uh, in the 30s, right, uh, Sylvia? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And they're both yeah, that is. Uh, oh, oh, they're both serials. Oh, so the Fu Manchu. Oh, so there was there was two serials running uh, uh, simultaneously. Oh, yeah. That's uh, the set is remarkable for its Art Deco uh, style. And here we have um, yes. When you compare the two, one is preferable, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so this, this was obviously aimed at <clears throat> white audiences and played upon the fear of the other in 1932. And the Charlie Chan movies domesticated the other. He was working on the side of good, and you saw an assimilated figure in with his son. Uh, so you, could, uh, you did not feel at all threatened by Charlie Chan. Fair to say? Mm -hmm. yeah, all right, well, shall we move ahead? Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, from here, from this movie to the 40s, uh, Japan has been fighting a war with China throughout the 30s, and, uh, uh, and most European nations have been somewhat ignoring it, um, although there are sympathizers uh, like Pearl Buck and Henry Luce, who publishes Time Life, uh, the Time Life conglomerate. And Americans don't seem to pay attention to the uh, rapid militarization of the Japanese until after Pearl Harbor. So these two images here are published in Time and Life magazine uh, in late December, just a few weeks after uh, 
uh, the Japanese attack Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. And so I, I find these images really interesting on a lot of levels. I think people have used this a lot um, um, in history classes to talk about the strangeness of racism. So maybe prior to this, it was OK to have a confused, generalizing racism that equally demonized Japanese and Chinese. Um, it wasn't so important to tell the difference, but now suddenly there are articles telling you how to tell the difference. Uh, one of the reasons being China ends up being an ally to the US, and so it's embarrassing to have people com uh, committing hate crimes against your allies. Uh, but then you have this whole history of uh, anti-Asian racism. The Japanese, although I didn't show it, were also demonized as um, cheap labor taking away jobs, uh, as were the Filipinos after them. So. This is uh, an attempt to have something like a more correct or friendly racism so that you attack the right people. And there is a Chinese reporter in, in one of the photographs here who has to write on his sleeve, uh, on his lapel, Chinese reporter, not Japanese, please. And you can imagine he's writing that because um, he's afraid of what might happen if he shows his face at, right after Pearl Harbor. Um, you can imagine just pointing to the modern era how, how people um, who were Arab or Muslim or even South Asian felt after 9-11, like right after the attacks, about how endangered they felt. Um, so uh, there's a close-up of one of the um, clips, how to tell your friends from the Japs. This is absurd uh, if you are or know Chinese or Japanese. I don't think you could actually use this list to tell them apart. They say things like, you know, facial expressions. The Chinese are more placid, kindly, open. The Japanese are more positive, dogmatic, arrogant. I think you could almost substitute Charlie Chan is placid, kindly, open. Fu Manchu is more positive, dogmatic, and arrogant. You can see how much these ideas rely on popular culture representations. Uh, some aristocratic Japanese have thin, aquiline noses, narrow faces, and except for their eyes, they look like Caucasians. That sounds very negative in this context, <laughs> somehow. Um, Japanese are nervous in conversation, laugh loudly at the wrong time. They walk stiffly erect, hard-heeled. Chinese more relaxed, have an easy gait, sometimes shuffle. Uh, you can imagine in another context, the Chinese more relaxed, have an easy gait, and shuffle could be read as being a lazy, undeserving laborer. So it's... Ideas here show up from before, they get recycled, and the historical context puts them into play sort of newly. Um, I, uh, I think those of you who are teaching World War II, I think this is a great text to um, introduce to show how different manage um, racism when that racism isn't politically expedient um, for you know, foreign alliances military purposes. Um, and also this leads into what we'll talk about in a second, the Japanese-American internment. We have a comment here in the uh, chat, Sylvia. Uh, Meryl Bell writes, at least Japan stood up for its immigrant citizens in the U.S. The gentleman's agreement between Japan and Theodore Roosevelt uh, sought to prevent school segregation of Japanese immigrants. Would you comment on that? Yeah, that's um, from, I believe, 1906 or 1907. Um, and uh, it's, it's a troubled incident because Japan was uh, uh, more respected as a government, and so it was more able to diplomatically um, lodge complaints, um, more able to than the Chinese government at the time. Um, but the, the, the uh, gentleman's agreement uh, was a mixed bag. First of all, it showed that in order to defend oneself from racism, one often had to be racist. So what the Japanese... Uh, uh, the Japanese government objected to was not segregated schools. They objected that the fact that San Francisco had segregated schools and that the Japanese had to go to school with the Chinese and the Negroes. They wanted to go to school with the whites. Um, so it wasn't objecting to segregation. It was objecting to being classified with the lower races. And then the agreement that Teddy Roosevelt in Japan came to was that he would try to intervene and um, thwart that school segregation. But in return, Japan would uh, stop uh, the immigration of male laborers to the US. So, you know, when we teach this uh, incident, it's kind of like, um, what do you actually win? You, you, you get this, you save face so that it seems like the government is able to intervene and stop this incident. But you give a concession, which is basically Japanese exclusion, but voluntarily on the Japanese government's part. Um, and it was 
very humiliating to the Japanese government. I think it actually did drive them to continue um, militarizing so that they could um, increase their pow uh, sphere of power in, 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 in East Asia, in Southeast Asia. Uh, and it didn't stop the U.S. from passing the Asian Exclusion Act in 1924, which stopped all Asians, Japanese, Chinese, Asian Indians. Um, uh, Koreans were considered Japanese at the time because Japan had colonized them. It, uh, it didn't stop them from uh, banning Japanese from immigrating from the American side either. So, so yet, uh, I think a picture like this shows you there are differences in the way groups are treated, but also those differences are very fragile and groups playing um, against one another uh, it's a difficult tricky thing so uh, I will say the Chinese really liked that the Japanese were demonized because they liked um, being on top for a while uh, and so the Chinese uh, took advantage of the Japanese being removed from the West Coast and entered into a lot of the business niches and they also enjoyed being the good Asians the once once history historian calls it being the good Asians in the good war um, uh, the Koreans were also really pleased that the Japanese were demonized because many Koreans were fighting for Korean independence under Japanese rule. So there were very few Koreans in the U.S. at the time, but those who were anti-colonial activists, resistance fighters, were really happy. And we know this in particular because there were Chinese and Japanese actors in Hollywood who jumped at the opportunity to play Japanese because they thought, if I can make the Japanese look worse, it's actually better for my race. So I'll take a little bit of hate on my part if it means that my race on the whole gets uh, gets to be moved ahead. So I think you just answered uh, you just answered our latest question here in the chat. How did other Asians view the Japanese Amer Americans after uh, the bombing of Pearl Harbor? So you talked about how other Asians viewed the Japanese. How did other Asians? Um, presumably in this country, view the Japanese Americans. And we're going to be getting on to that. Maybe we want to hold that question in abeyance uh, and, and move ahead. Here we, well, here we are. So uh, let's put that question on the table. How did other Asians view the Japanese Americans after the bombing of Pearl Harbor? Well, I mean, after the bombing, and those of you who teach internment know a lot of this history, uh, but I, I love using this text because everyone knows Dr. Seuss, right? Cat in the Hat. Um, uh, uh, green eggs and ham. He wrote for a left-wing periodical that was trying to, you know, um, uh, sort of ramp up support for the war. And so this this um, this cartoon was written, ironically, just days before FDR issued Executive Order 9066, which authorized the internment. And so the theory was that the Japanese were dangerous because the Japanese Americans were dangerous because they were an extension of Japan. And they were also sort of all in lockstep, thinking identically um, with one another. And uh, it's like they're being issued uh, dynamite so that they could go sabotage some military installation. Um, this was the feeling of a lot of people, I don't want to say everyone, um, and a lot of Asian Americans, Chinese Americans, Korean Americans, were happy to stay silent in this. I don't want to say they all piled on and criticized the Japanese for being traitors, but they did not vocally defend the Japanese for the most part. Very few people did um, uh, at the early years uh, of the internment. And so um, uh, the public sentiment was such that when, and even the Japanese Americans, when they were issued the order by FDR that they would have to evacuate their homes, um, we have a couple cases of, of legalize the constitutionality of the internment, but there's no mass riots, there's no armed resistance. Uh, many Japanese Americans thought they had to go to the camps because resisting going to the camps, even if it was illegal, would show that they were disloyal. So it was a very trying time for Asian Americans. And the Chinese Americans who um, fill the you know the stores that the Japanese left and the neighborhoods that they left. Um, they may not have defended the Japanese, but they were aware too that they had to appear super duper loyal um, or else their loyalties would be suspect. So it was a, um, I would say that it was a mixed kind of victory for non-Japanese Asian Americans. Uh, their status was elevated as symbolic allies, but they still had to watch their step very closely. We have a question here in the chat. Are those ships in the background saying that the Japanese were entering through Canada? 
that, that might have been an implication. I think it's also just um, that they would be um, filling the West Coast um, because the Japanese Americans, um, there were a lot of Japanese Americans in Seattle as well. And in Canada. Canada had its own internment, which a lot of people aren't aware of. It was smaller, but it was still oh. it's present. Um, and yeah, the Japanese were well, not Japan. popular in Asia. So if you were Chinese and you had relatives in China, and Japan had been bombing China since the early 30s, you know, and the rape of Nanking takes place in the 30s, um, you are happy to have the, uh, the Japanese turn into the enemy. But again, that didn't always translate to necessarily to you were going to go out and attack your Japanese American neighbor, because again, the, the line is thin, just, you know, just as we, can, we saw here. Uh, people couldn't tell the difference between you and the Japs, um, and it would, uh, you wouldn't want to run around um, calling attention to yourself as an ethnic group um, during the war. So a lot of racial politics get complicated in the war. Um, those of you who teach stuff about African Americans know that African Americans were divided about whether they should um, happily and voluntarily be drafted for the war effort or whether they should sit out. Um, and a lot of African Americans said, um, uh, Japan was no enemy as long as they were fighting the white man. They didn't care. Uh, so this is a small minority, but vocal sentiment heard in um, some circles. I, th I want to show you an example of this. Um, uh, uh, gosh, we're running out of time, Richard. I'm sorry. Uh, do we go to eight? Richard? Um, I think what I'll do here is is um, play a bit of this and then I'll just zoom through. This is a documentary at the end of the war, which is supposed to get, um, oh, 830, great, um, get Asian American, uh, I'm sorry, to get Americans um, reconciled to the idea that they had to really um, uh, fight hard against the Japanese, possibly kill every last one before the war would be over. Um, ironically, um, this, this movie had been in production all throughout the 40, uh, 44 and 45. It finally got released. Um, and then Hiroshima happened. Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the dropping of the A-bomb happened um, like three day, within three days of this movie coming out. So it was obsolete. It was trying to make a point that the Japanese were sworn enemy and difficult to um, defeat. And yet after dropping the atomic bomb, um, the, the movie had no use and was pulled and was out of circulation for a while. But it's, it's now on, on DVD. So I'm going to play a part of this, and you'll see some of the um, intertwining of military and economic perils. Taking advantage of these low labor costs, the industrialists of Japan knew they could undersell every other nation on earth, and they did. All over the world, they dumped their cheap labor products. And to their dumping, they added piracy. Countless patented articles were manufactured and sold throughout Asia under their American names. The two best known American spark plugs. Genuine old Scotch whiskey was made in the distilleries of Osaka. Matches made in Kobe were labeled made in Sweden. They undersold silk to the silk producing Italians. They undersold England's cotton goods in the home of her own cotton industry. They undersold beer to the beer producing Germans. American toothbrushes, retailing at 35 to 50 cents each, were copied in Japan to retail in American chain stores at 10 cents each. They even undersold us with our own American flag. And with the money accumulated in foreign countries with these cheap labor exports, did they in turn buy automobiles, ice boxes, or food? Did they erect better homes for the Jap workers or improve their living conditions? No, indeed. Instead, they imported oil, scrap iron, tin, rubber, aluminum, and secretly built up their powerful war machine. A fanatic nation turning its sweat into weapons for conquest. Sweat for guns. Sweat for planes. Sweat for ships. Sweat for war.
Um, okay, so <laughs> that documentary is fascinating. Um, and like I said, it's, it's available on DVD. And um, yes, I, I think you could uh, replace Japan with China or Vietnam or South Korea, and uh, you could run this as an anti-trade ad today. Uh, so like I said, the history of this movie is that Frank Capra, you know, It's a Wonderful Life, Frank Capra, uh, made this because a lot of filmmakers went into, um, were recruited into the army to make films, um, propaganda films, uh, home front films. And uh, the footage, so this film is a great way to teach not only um, an attitude, but also how the film medium can be used and twisted to make a point. Because as a documentary, it doesn't film its own images. Uh, it uses found footage. So uh, Capra was supplied with stock images from old Japanese movies. So movies like samurai movies or random things. And then newsreel um, images, some of them from the war, but a lot of them before the war. And random footage of people working, people making matches, toothbrushes. And the, the whole documentary is like this. And he edits them together very effectively uh, to create a sense of panic and um, menace out of what could be very normal images. Uh, if you teach other films at all, this is very much like a, a form of Russian montage filmmaking uh, associated with Sergei Eisenstein. Fast images, um, and they're cut rhythmically with the music. And some of the image, I, images, I don't know if you noticed, were sped up. So people were working really frantically, much um, uh, superhuman speeds, uh, to, to give a sense of their crazed, um, military fanaticalness. There's also, I think you might notice, a lot of the images are not of individuals. I mean, and again, they're fast, so even if they were of individuals, you wouldn't get a sense of a real person. But there are masses of people, like a, a row of women um, uh, working on pottery, a row of fishermen pulling up nets. And it gives this constant sense, just like in the uh, cartoon here, that the Japanese are never individuals, that they all hive mind or some Borg mind, uh, if you uh, know Star Trek, that they think alike. And this is one of the arguments that the movie, the movie is made by the U.S. Army with the War Department's um, approval of all uh, elements of the script. It's meant to be shown to the American home front, but also to soldiers, so, um, so that they would know what they're fighting. Uh, it's made, meant to convey that the Japanese enemy is fanatical um, and doesn't just fight because he's told to, he fights because he wants to, and in his, the very core of his being. This contrasts with the way German soldiers were shown in an equivalent. It wasn't called Know Your Enemy Japan. I think it was called um, Here is Germany. The G German soldiers were shown as ordinary people who were led, misled by a bad government. But the Japanese here are, are depicted as perfectly willing to have their labor converted into, um, what was it, sweat for guns, sweat for planes sweat for war. Um, I'd be curious to stop here for a second and um, see what people's uh, reactions are to the film. I think it's an old piece of propaganda, but I think it's very effective as a piece of propaganda. Um, the music kind of stirs my emotions, at least. It makes me upset, and it ends with all the explosions sort of ringing in your ear. Um, I think if I were to show this in my class, um, and, I, and I do teach this one a lot, I ask a lot, you know, what what feelings, not just thoughts, but feelings do you come away with from about the Japanese? If, you're, if you can imagine yourself as an American going to see this in the midst of knowing that your family and friends are fighting the Japanese over in um, Burma or in um, the Philippines or Midway. Um, so, so okay. Like, well, yeah. Go ahead. Well, when we put that out there, what, what do our participants think about the movie? And, and <clears throat> would it be something useful? For you to use in your in your classes, uh, some uh, folks are responding. You know, one thing you could do with the movie uh, is give it to students without any titling and with the sound turned down, and ask them if this is a um, a movie that is critical of Japan or uh, praising Japan, because all of those images were of industrious people, you know, working hard. Um, and, and industry uh, producing things. So they, those images, you're right, that the, the, the narration is what uh, infuses the film with meaning. The images themselves uh, could be taken in a variety of ways. Uh, we haven't gotten any comments yet, but I know they're coming in. Uh, how do your students respond to this, uh, Sylvia? Uh, 
I think they're shocked, and I've never tried the trick you mentioned of, of showing it without the sound, um, and you're right. They watch the uh, film in, in its entirety. Uh, some of the images, uh, we talk a lot about how um, understandings of culture can be turned quickly into misunderstandings of culture. So mm -hmm. some of the images are of things we stereotypically associate with Japan. You don't see it in this scene, but samurai, um, Shinto mm -hmm. shrines, um, little children doing calisthenics. Um, and it's amazing how they, they'll take the most sort of innocuous of images, like, oh, the Japanese, you know, worship this way, or they, they have Shinto you know, um, uh, icons. And the narration and the music turns like an innocent factual image into something really sinister. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Here we have Susan C. writes, I think this movie still creates a sense of panic with the music and the narration. Without the music, I would think it would be an interesting comparison. Richard is right. A lot of what we see here is valued industry, uh, for example, but I feel at the same time this would be amazingly effective, presumably as propaganda. Yeah, so shall we move ahead? Yes, um, I know I'm running out of time. Uh, so just as a counterpoint, um, I don't want you to feel like everything was... Um, so anti-Japanese. Ansel Adams, famous American photographer, uh, was invited to Manzanar Camp, which is in uh, Eastern California, near the Nevada border. And he was allowed to take photographs of the camp somewhat freely, although he did have three restrictions, I should note. Um, he was allowed to wander to camp and take pictures of whatever, he, whatever and whomever he wanted, as long as he didn't take pictures of barbed wire, of armed guards, and of guard towers. So it's this interesting thing in which he is able to paint what seems to be a very sympathetic portrait of Japanese Americans. It says 1944, he took the photos in 43, um, so really um, in the middle of the war when we weren't sure um, who was going to win. Um, and so for, in that sense, he was very uh, um, early in, in, in being sort of a defender of the Japanese Americans. Um, but, but because he wasn't allowed to take pictures of the camp as a prison camp, it gave the feeling that the internment was something fairly benign, and it didn't give the sense that it was truly a prison camp, that people were guarded um, by armed guards, and that they were not um, allowed to freely, um, not only freely travel in and out of the camps, but not always freely associate with people within the camps. There was a lot of sort of surveillance and spying in a lot of different camps. So I, uh, this entire book is available at the Library of Congress for free because Adams donated his negatives to the Library of Congress uh, in 1965. And one of the most interesting images from this book is he took a lot of images of schoolgirls. So I think there were about, there's, there's images of the backdrop. Uh, you can see from here, uh, Adams is famous for his landscape photos, and that part of California is beautiful. Um, so there's a, a bit of the rugged wilderness, and the Japanese are in the rugged wilderness. Uh, it makes them look like sort of wild uh, west pioneers homesteading, although they're not homesteading, they're in a prison camp. Uh, but he took almost one quarter of his portrait, his um, uh, close-up portraits of young schoolgirls. Uh, and these are his titles in the published book. And this one says, is her future only a hope and not an assurance? Uh, and I also teach this book as well, um, as a, not always in the contrast of the other one, um, sometimes on its own to give a sense of what a defense of the uh, Japanese Americans might have looked like. So this is seemingly a non-yellow peril picture, but also the problems of that defense. So I don't know if um, this is something that you can see right away. I think at, at first, kind of like Charlie Chan, it looks very positive, and it's hard to see sort of a negative, but I, there has been sort of a negative side to this, this portrait since. Uh, Sylvia, we have a, a comment uh, here. Without the barbed wire, soldiers um, take away. Um, you can take away the um, prison. Take away the imprisonment aspect of Manzanar. It sounds like the U.S. government wanted the internment uh, to be portrayed in a more positive light. Uh, yeah, by this time, 1944, we had seen pictures of German concentration camps, and I suspect the government did not want any parallels drawn between what we were doing and what the Germans were doing at that time. Is that fair to say? I think that's definitely true. And also, I think they didn't want to highlight the fact that there were constitutional challenges to the internment, that it was uh -huh. an unlawful um, 
uh, deprivation of civil rights. So everyone who had Japanese ancestry had to go to the camps, whether or not you had disloyal ties or did something that made you suspicious. Um, some interracial families uh, had to be locked up together or risk being separated. Um, about 70% of the internees were Nisei, second generation, so citizens by birth. Mm -hmm. um, so they weren't just immigrants with ambiguous level of rights, but they were um, American citizens by birth. Um, and many of them, not all of them, many of them fairly um, disidentified with Japan by that point. Um, uh, some of you mm -hmm. might teach the 442nd, which was the um, Japanese American um, uh, volunteer troop, which was uh, one of the most decorated. Uh, one of the most uh, celebrated uh, of, um, military companies uh, during the World War II. But yeah, uh, so this this image is um, just like, just like you know, without the barbed wire, uh, barbed wires. This image gives a sense of the camp as not the most horrible thing in the world, um, even though it's at the same time showing you the injustice of the camp by saying, you know, how could you imprison such a Beautiful little girl, smiley little girl. Well, we have we have a number of co interesting comments here. One, <clears throat> Allison Rees writes, "I wonder if this was uh, an intentional effort on Adams' part to mislead, and uh, she wonders if Adams' aesthetic sense of calmness and naturalism took over in his portrayals." And then um, Amelia Philbrook writes, "I understand the use of young girls." Uh, if he's trying to paint a sympathetic image, boys grow into soldiers, but girls are significantly more safe. And then another participant writes, despite the constitutional question, the Supreme Court upheld the constitutional legal legality of internment. That's an interesting point about the use of young girls. They're not threatening. If you want to create an image of an unthreatening uh, group of people, um, shoot uh, lovely young girls like the one in this picture. Right. Um, there are young boys imprisoned in the camps too, and also adult women and men, and they're not left out. I, I chose this one as, as emblematic of a certain thing that he does a lot. But if you look at the um, collection as a whole, th there are some older um, people. Like uh, there's a there's a nurse. Um, there's a couple of Japanese American soldiers. Um, they're not smiling um, in many cases, and they're not quite as um, picturesque um, in some ways. Um, Oh, I, I noticed in the comments there are now we have pictures that were taken from Japanese Americans about ordinary life in the camp. So we do have sort of images of the ordinary life, um, images of baseball and stuff. But there are also images of um, uh, sumo wrestling, uh, obon festival, uh, celebrations of Japanese culture that I don't think Adams took a single picture of because in order to defend the Japanese Americans, he had to really present a picture of them literally born free and equal, so identical to um, non-Asian Americans, assimil uh, assimilated and white. Uh, so, okay. Yeah. Let me just pose one question, and then we can, can we move on. We've got about 20 minutes. How was this book received when it came out in 1944? You know, I, I don't know for sure um, uh, in, uh, in the sense of like whether it was universally um, admired. I think it was uh, received in small circles. He, he exhibited some of these pictures in MoMA, so in uh, more uh, upper-class artistic um, liberal circles, I think people were receptive to his defense of the Japanese Americans, but at the same time, these are not the circles who were most threatened by the Japanese. Um, as we saw earlier, um, a lot of the conflicts between Asians, Japanese and Chinese, um, and uh, white workers were from working class, um, more recent immigrant groups, so not Museum of Modern Art people, but um, Dennis Kearney and the Irish um, Working Men's Party. So uh, those people are not seeing this exhibit, uh, therefore they're not on record, as far as I can tell, of objecting to it. But we have many defenses of the internment as necessary, because you know a Jap is a Jap. Um, so it, I think providing a sort of a, a view of the different opinions shows you um, that different groups and geographically and you know class-wise reacted differently to the internment. Um, so it gives you a sense that it's not just all homogenous, but even the defenses can't quite speak to everything that um, is what makes someone Japanese American. It has to sort of white whitewash them. Um, so I can, okay. Well, shall shall we move ahead? Yes. Then? Sorry, I'm going to. Uh, 
give you a quick glimpse of some Cold War stuff before we get to the Vietnam War. After World War II, Japan was rehabilitated very quickly because uh, even during the war, China, um, as an ally, is fighting its own sort of civil war between the nationalists and the communists. And four years after the end of World War II, China um, becomes a communist state. And, uh, and North Korea starts, well, it's not called North Korea at the time, but there is a fight over um, Korea as well, which the U.S. enters as proxy war, um, police action actually with the UN. And so Japan is really necessary as an ally. It's neutered in many ways because uh, it's occupied by the U.S. for part of the war um, and forced to give her several concessions at, um, as military bases. And then even as a free independent Japan, it's uh, uh, it's relied upon as a military ally and, the, um, and not as its own defender since Japanese government that's rewritten after the war is a government without its own standing military. I think something similar was written into uh, uh, Germany for a time. Just Japan had to rely on the U.S. for uh, military defense. So Japan not only uh, was allied with the U.S., but welcomed U.S. troops to fight or defend its borders. So Korean War, uh, there's some Korean War uh, films, one of them, Steel Helmet, and you start to see that's Richard Liu, a Chinese-American actor. He's playing a Japanese Nisei soldier who's fighting in the Korean War. And in, in this film, and there's also a black American and a white American, the blacks are uh, fight the Korean War as the first integrated war because Truman integrates the, um, the military by um, executive order. And in this film, a North Korean uh, tries to sow discontent um, uh, among the U.S. troops by saying, hey, you know, what about Jim Crow? What about the Japanese American internment? How can you fight for a country that does these things to you? And part of the message of the film is, well, it does these things to us, but we're getting better and, you know, um, it's still better than you, North Korea. Um, so there's a sense of attempted unity in the face of a new communist threat. Um, part of that attempted unity is also the birth of the model minority. This, this is also a very big concept that um, many of you can teach, uh, do teach. The Flower Drum Song is an amazing film uh, from the, the 60s, partly because it has so many Asian faces. Uh, and they're singing and dancing and doing wondrous things. But it's also an amazing film because it shows a strange portrait. This is a Rodgers and Hammerstein musical based on a Chinese American novel, but the songs are all Rodgers and Hammerstein lyrics and, and um, setups. The film is a portrait of San Francisco Chinatown as if it were a piece of segregated China in the middle of the US. So there, there's a lot of Americanness, but there are no Americans. It's, it's a Chinatown uh, occupied almost entirely by Chinese who never leave Chinatown. Um, seemingly for anything. Uh, so it's an interesting version of the model minority as someone who seems happy to be part of the US, but also held apart from the US. Um, and uh, it's got some great um, songs um, that, to teach it there. The famous one is, I, uh, I Enjoy Being a Girl. And then The Manchurian Candidate, which is around the same time. Uh, it's about the Korean War, though the war has already ended. And it's the idea that the Soviets and the Chinese are allied in trying to find ways to infiltrate and defeat American culture. So the, the man standing is uh, um, Lawrence Harvey, actor Lawrence Harvey playing, playing Raymond Shaw, whose parents are Amer uh, American politicians. His dad, steps dad, is an American politician. And he gets brainwashed by the Koreans uh, to kill on command subconsciously. So he doesn't know. So he's an ordinary good old American boy, but he infiltrates uh, American culture because he's actually uh, following the commands of, of the communist um, East, Russia and China combined. Um, and his mother's Aunt Angela Lansbury, and she's also turns out to be a, a Soviet operative. And together they try to assassinate a presidential candidate so that um, they can uh, become president. And Basically, the Manchurian candidate would be the Manchurians who run the American government from inside. So this is a thriller, a little bit of a um, schlocky film, but at the same time, um, portrayed some real fears that people were debating. Um, so I have some disturbing images I wanted to warn people about before I show them as we turn to the Vietnam War. Um, the Vietnam War, as sometimes people forget, is also a Cold War war uh, fought over whether um, Vietnam would be uh, communist like the North or ostensibly democratic like the South. I say ostensibly because it's complicated, um, the, the people in charge uh, of South Vietnam. This 
photograph is taken by an American photographer at the height of the well, one of the heights of the war at the Tet Offensive, 1968, uh, four years into the war after the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. And it's I don't I think many of you know this picture. It's famous, but the context of the photo is fascinating too. It's a um, South Vietnamese general, General Nguyen Ngoc Man, shooting a North Korean uh, he he um, no sorry, North Korean North Vietnamese spy. Uh, without a trial on the streets of Saigon during the Tet Offensive, which uh, was a massive offense by the Viet Cong in the north of Vietnamese during what was supposed to be a truce over a holiday. And uh, uh, because they were sort of terrorizing major cities like Saigon and there was a sense of unrest, I think that's why a sense of martial law prevailed and there weren't ar orderly arrests and trials that a lot of um, um, seemingly uncontrolled violence. And so this image shocked a lot of people because, not just because they necessarily didn't know that the war was so violent, but they didn't realize that we were losing. The, um, if you didn't know who the shooters were, it could give you the sense that um, the Vietnamese are in control and they're killing uh, everyone around them. Um, so you might think that the South Vietnamese general is actually North Vietnamese. It might also give you the sense, if you did know the, who the people were, that we're not fighting on the right side. Because if the general who's doing the executing is committing a human rights violation, um, and we're on his side, and who, what are these people that we're defending? Um, so it gave a lot of people a sense of lack of confidence um, in the South Vietnamese regime. And Cronkite says sort of soon after the Tet Offensive, not just based on this image, but on other images, that um, he, he feels like he, um, the, the war is turning, that we are losing, and he can't in good conscience support it anymore. So a lot of people talk about this as the turning of the American sentiment against the war. Um, the war is complicated, but I want to point out some uh, um, the implications of having this image become predominant image of the Vietnamese because it starts to fit into the yellow peril uh, imagery even though there are no Vietnamese in America in, in the early 20th century. Um, Vietnam is a French colony um, and there's not much immigration from out, um, out of Vietnam at the time to the US. And it also gives the sense that uh, there's this sort of communist threat. So it's China, it's North Korea, it's North Vietnam. Um, that Communism has somehow be, been racialized. I know they're Soviet communists, but uh, the communist enemies we see the most often are Vietnamese. So in a very popular film, Deer Hunter, uh, comes out after the war, a lot of the things that we see during the war as news images, that was a news image, become twisted around and sensationalized and become things that the Vietnamese do to Americans. So I'm going to play a little clip. It's a little bit violent, uh, although it's not if you know the film, it's not the most violent clip in the film. And I think it gives you a sense of how an image about how the war was fought between North and South Vietnamese becomes a symbol of how Vietnamese treat Americans. And so that there's no North and South now, it's just the Vietnamese are the enemy and how they treat Americans. They're gonna throw you in a pit. They throw you in a pit, you're gonna die. Listen down, I can go out! You can do it. Man, move! You can do it, Steve. Move! 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 Come on. Go ahead. Go ahead, Stevie. Go ahead. Oh, you got Come on. Go ahead. Come on. 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 Come
Doom and my... Hey, kid. So I think um, this is one of the first Vietnam War movies to come out. Uh, it's not the first, but it's one of the first to come out after the war. And it starts to shift the war so that um, rather than focusing on the vast number of Vietnamese that were fighting and fighting each other and fighting for the control of, and slash independence of their country, um, the war becomes about Vietnamese versus Americans. And so in the scene, uh, it's not even the violence of war, like soldiers shooting at each other. It's POWs captured, and now their lives are being toyed with um, by their Vietnamese captors. If, if you'll notice uh, filmically, it's uh, it really gives you a sense of claustrophobia and confinement because all the shots are taken sort of very close to the actors' faces and you can't see all the people that are surrounding them. Um, they're also being confined underneath the hut, so you see a, a brief clip of Christopher Walken who's underneath the hut. And after the scene where Stevie, played by John Savage, actually was, um, they're betting on whether he's going to shoot himself in the head and he actually really should be dead, but he kind of cheated and shot the ceiling. Um, after, after this happens, they, they kind of laugh, they exchange money, and they throw him into a watery cage. So it shows, you know, the abuse of prisoners, sort of unjust behavior during the war, um, and uh, the carelessness with which the Vietnamese treat American lives. And I think this was really problematic um, for, for a lot of people because the war was certainly had uh, American POWs being mistreated, but it also had a lot of Americans mistreating um, Vietnamese POWs and civilians. It's, it was an ugly war on all sides. Um, and a movie like this sort of cuts down the controversy and kind of closes closes down things you might know from New Line Massacre or the Tet Offensive um, and changes it into um, Americans as uh, the victims of the war. I should note that although there is a lot of um, uh, deserved attention to American casualties in the war, about 55. Uh, it's estimated that about a one, one and a quarter million and perhaps two, uh, South Vietnamese and two million North Vietnamese died in the war. So the impact of the war was big on America, but nothing like the proportional impact on um, both North and South Vietnam. Hey, okay, Sylvia, so shall we move ahead? We've got about uh, seven minutes or so. We can go a little over. <clears throat> yeah. I, I don't have too much more. It's it's sort of just still images showing moving us to the present. You'll notice here that um, uh, uh, the Manchurian candidate comes back. Uh, the 1990s, and obviously it's it's campaign scandal. Um, I'm not saying that it didn't happen, but in a funny way, racist stereotypes get brought in to talk about it. So when foreigners donate money to um, Democrats, uh, rather than it being the foreigners' fault, the Democrats become or honorary yellow face Asians. So uh, Al Gore is a corrupt Buddhist monk taking donations. Uh, 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 Bill Clinton is a coolie, so you see the coolie hat. And then um, Hillary Clinton is a Maoist. You see her Maoist cap on there with the um, her little red book, Mao red book. Um, and interestingly, the one of the political cartoons that comes out of this scandal, the reason why this was um, interesting to Asian Americans is that it, it had a chilling effect on Asian American participation in the political process because it it implied that the foreign money coming in was foreign by nature of the people. So if you were an American citizen donating, um, but you were Asian American, you were still suspect. So John Huang is the bundler who bundled the money for some Indonesian bankers. Um, he's one of the people who did plead guilty to campaign finance charges. Uh, this picture of John Huang's lining up to vote, it wasn't a scandal about voting, it was a scandal about donating, but it turns into a scandal about voting in this cartoon, and they start to look a lot like the uh, Dr. Seuss cartoon where the Japanese are lining up to bomb America with TNT. And the, uh, uh, the only thing suspicious about him is that his name is Huang, and all of their names are Huang, and so what are we doing with all these identical John Huangs? And, um, and I think uh, a final image for us to think about, because the Asian 
peril uh, persist in different forms. Uh, we are ambiguously allies with China now, although, like many people said, we make accusations about economic perils uh, against China and Japan still. North Korea still uh, is a political enemy, and so we will see uh, Fu Manchu-like absurd depictions of our political enemies. Um, here, this is from the recent movie, The Interview, and which is about a plot to assassinate Kim Jong-un being, it's kind of an absurdist plot. Uh, I've only seen descriptions of this movie. I did not download it on Google Play when it was playing over the holidays. But I think I, I bring it up to show you that um, the portrayals of absurd megalomaniacal Asian leaders still persist in ways that sort of simple oversimplify and diminish what politically might be involved in, in, in having these um, uh, these enemy states uh, in contest with the U.S. And the actor playing Kim Jong-un is Randall Park. If any of you are watching TV today, he is the father of uh, in Fresh Off the Boat, totally different character in that film. Fresh Off the Boat is kind of like number one son, Key Luke, um, starring in a sitcom. So you, you have friendly Asians and who themselves play unfriendly Asians, and they continue to have an effect on Asian Americans, even though they are supposed to be portraits of Asians. Um, they're intimately connected because Asian Americans, uh, more than some other racial groups like African Americans, are constantly connected to what happens in their countries of origin, even if they're separated by generations. So I think these images show you a lot of continuity between you know, internment and campaign finance, between the Cold War pressures and, and, and voting pressures today, um, between tortures now and fake tortures that are Fu Manchu, and also economic pressures, um, ways in which economics are how Asians are seen as threatened. Sylvia, <clears throat> would it be fair to say that today the Japanese, Vietnamese, and South Koreans are, are pretty well domesticated? I mean, we, we don't, do we see them as uh, the other still today. Now, of course, the Chinese, I think I think the people in this country feel rather ambivalent. I mean, if you go to a big city, I was in New York a few weeks ago, and um, they're Asians. Uh, uh, lots of folks in the crowd are Asians, and, the, and I, I think they're Chinese. Uh, how would you take the temperature of America's attitude toward Asians today, uh, dividing them into into their, their, uh, their ethnic groups? I think discrimination against Asians, that wasn't the topic, um, so I couldn't give examples here, um, mm -hmm. still exists, but it doesn't, it's not like um, Black Lives Matter. There aren't Asians being visibly um, thrown down in the streets or shot by police, sort of, but they are um, still discriminated against in violent ways and not always by the state. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, most recently, let's see, um, I'm trying to think. There, uh, Cho Sun Hui, the Asian American shooter uh, in the Virginia Tech shootings, was a South Korean student. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Like you were saying, Richard, we don't think of South Koreans as threatening because we're not at war in South Korea. But when Cho Sun Hui shot people up, it was two hours from my campus. Um, mm -hmm. He was from a North Virginia suburb. There certainly was a lot of talk about, you know, is there something in Korean culture, like in Korean movies nowadays, that make him more violent? Is he um, is he violent because he's too much of a foreigner still? Because he he, he we still have immigrants. Um, not all Asian mm -hmm. Americans are um, born and raised here. He was he immigrated when he was little. So it is was he mentally ill or unstable or angry because mm -hmm. he was an immigrant? A lot of people saying you know are Asians angry in ways that are dangerous? So a lot of Asian American students. Um, at, right after the shooting, had reports of teachers calling the police on them because they were writing strange, you know, creative writing essays in class, or they were acting belligerently um, in ways that frightened them. I, I don't want to say that this is equivalent to being shot, but um, there's definitely ways in which these stereotypes reared their ugly heads. And mm -hmm. if we go to war with Korea, you know, things will happen that mm -hmm. you know, are buried, just like we saw how quickly attitudes changed towards Japanese when we went to war with them, and how attitudes changed towards China when they became enemies you know, during the Cold War. So uh, the attitudes simmering there um, come to the fore in ways. Um, I'm not saying that we, can't, we don't change as a nation, but a lot of these buried things come out again. Mm -hmm. 
They're still there. They're just beneath the surface. Yes. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the <clears throat> end of our seminar. Let me ask if there are any final questions or comments. <clears throat> Wait to see if anybody has any final questions or comments. In the meantime, Sylvia, let me thank you for this seminar. I think you've given our teachers a lot of material to work with, and you've given us a lot of insights and things to talk about, think about. Thank you very much. I appreciate you doing this for us. Thank you for inviting me, Richard. You're welcome. And ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank all of you for your participation in the seminar this evening. Please join us again for our next seminar, which will be April 23rd, Gandhi and King on the March, The Power of Nonviolence. Let, re let me remind you, too, that we would like to have your <clears throat> evaluations. Please send, that, please send those in to us. And uh, join us again, ladies and gentlemen. We're coming to the end of our seminar season. I think we've got about three seminars left, and we put together a good seminar program for you in the fall. We'll have that out pretty soon. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you, and good evening.